Um, okay, I'm going to get started. Um, I'm Paul, and um, what I, I'll be sharing about is um, some ideas on how we meet um, our, our needs now and in the future in terms of food and, um, and uh, its impacts on the environment. Um, so a little bit of context. Um, obviously, we need to meet um, all the needs of, of everyone on, on, on the planet today, which uh, as of now we aren't yet, um, and meet the needs of more people into the future. Um, that becomes more challenging as more and more people around the world are eating meat. Um, in that uh, it takes a lot of feed and land, of course, um, in order to uh, feed the, um, all the cattle um, and chicken and goats, etc. cetera. Um, another thing about agriculture is that it has a tremendous impact on our climate, on water availability, on water quality. Um, and if that isn't a challenge enough, as we all know, this is why we're here, um, is that uh, we have to figure out how to do all of this on a planet that is warming. When we look at farmers around the world, uh, you know, certainly there's a, a wide range of, of types of farmers, um, both um, a, a, a number of farmers on a large scale, but most of the farmers around the world uh, are farming um, s small areas. Um, and obviously there's not just a few farmers, there are, are millions of farmers um, around the world. And agriculture currently occupies about 40% of uh, all of the land um, on earth. Uh, when you add up all of the pastures, that's about the size of Africa. And when you add up all of the croplands, that's about the size of, of South America. And what this slide here shows is just how, um, how just in the croplands, how they have increased over time. Um, and nowadays, most of the agriculture is expanding in the tropics. Um, So while food is grown on individual farms, um, where it is, uh, is eaten or consumed around the world, um, is, it, it, it varies across the world. So this is a map of, of coffee, and it just shows that, um, like, obviously where we are now is not a place that it's growing coffee. And uh, it is largely grown, or almost all, all grown, in the tropics and then shipped around the world. When you look at it from um, a, a bigger point of view, about a fifth of all the calories that are produced on farmlands are traded around the world. And the majority of that is wheat and soy and maize, or corn. So what I'm going to talk about here is something that um, I and my colleagues and a number of other people around the world are working on, where we um, look at some of the really big, um, uh, like, umbrella type of, of uh, strategies or issues. Um, so on the first one is, um, uh, is looking at ways of growing more food on, on current land. And this is important because when you look at the trends of wheat and rice and maize and soy, um, about a fifth or, uh, or a third or more of the lands that are producing um, maize and wheat and rice and soy, that the um, yields over time have, uh, have have flattened out. So what we've done in, in some analysis is looking at, um, instead of um, identifying ways of increasing yields where the yields are already high, say in Europe and in the US and Canada, Brazil, um, 
we said, well, what would it look like if um, all those areas that aren't in, in dark green where our yields are already fairly high or very high, um, and what if we um, brought up all of those areas that are, have uh, smaller yields uh, um, up to like at least a middle range? And so we found that at least in terms of calories, um, which you know is not the same as health, I realize, and food security, but um, you could have enough calories for a, a tremendous number of people. Like uh, it's a similar amount to all the people that uh, are currently uh, undernourished. Um, and the majority of those opportunities certainly are parts, as you can see, uh, in Western Africa, uh, Eastern Europe, um, and a few other places around the world. And uh, this is just a graphic of uh, something that we had, had done with uh, um, a, a number of colleagues at, at National Geographic where if you zoom in on, on Southern Africa, those areas that are in brown are places where um, the uh, all the yields are, are are much lower than uh, what is is possible in those <clears throat> in those areas. So a second step here is to use what we already grow more efficiently, and what I'm talking about there is that um, more and more of what we um, eat and what looks like on our plates looks less and less like this, um, and more and more like this, which is fine, and uh, it just uh, is, is good and, and tasty, but um, it, it has a tremendous amount of impact on the environment, both in terms of our climate and uh, in terms of the, of the land and calories that it takes to um, use as feed for our animals. Um, and, and this all adds up to a tremendous amount. Uh, when we look um, around the globe, I don't know if I have this stat on here. No, I don't. Um, but more than, um, more than a third of all the calories that are produced on our croplands um, don't end up um, on the plates. Uh, so, and that is accounting for um, all of the calories that are in um, in, in meat and dairy and eggs, et cetera. But um, there's just, it, it's an um, inefficient um, effort uh, when you are using feed in order to produce um, an animal or animal products. Another big uh, issue is that um, about a third of all of the, of the food that's produced around the world is either lost or, or wasted. Um, and um, in a lot of the um, developing world, that is, um, is loss, which is happening either in the field or um, on the way to market or in storage. And then in other places in the world, like in Europe um, and the US, um, most of that is, is waste, which happens uh, in the cafeterias and restaurants, at the grocery stores, in our refrigerators. When we've looked at, um, or when we looked at the um, amount of land that is required for um, the waste that we have, and we had done some analysis in the U.S. and China and India, and actually for a number of, of countries around the world, but. We did this analysis to highlight that um, that all waste is not the same. So, for example, even if you waste um, a small amount of beef, it has um, much more impact in terms of uh, of the land that is um, embodied uh, in the beef as compared to um, a kilogram of wheat. And it's similar if you are, are looking at rice or maize or other, other crops as well. So a third area I want to talk about is that 
is, is identifying opportunities to um, grow our food more efficiently. So uh, um, around the world, um, our, our, our use of water around the world, about 70% of all the water that's used um, around the world is for agriculture. And the majority of that is in a small set of countries and for a small set of crops. And the reason that I, I highlight a small set of countries and a small set of crops is that when we find, when we're looking at impacts on climate, impacts on water availability, water quality, habitat, it's, is, is, in general, is, is generally explained by a small set of places around the world and a small set of, of crops or, or livestock. And the reason that that's important is that in order to affect change around the world, we have to have at least uh, a decent amount of focus in those areas on, on, um, on that food that is produced in those areas. Um, in terms of, of the quality of the water, um, globally about half of the fertilizer um, and manure that's applied ends up um, in the crop at, at the time of harvest. Um, some of what is, is left over is building up in the soil, um, but certainly a decent amount it leaches into um, our groundwater or is runoff that ends up um, in our, our streams and, and lakes and, and coastlands. Similar story here is that when you look at where most of the excess is occurring, um, it's both because high amounts of fertilizer are applied, but um, it's, um, and, and, and that there is so much land in agriculture in those areas, which also um, um, is, uh, it results in a lot of, of the excess around the world is coming from a small set of places. And again, a small set of crops explain most of the, of the story around the world. So I've talked a little bit about, um, about, about water availability and water quality. I'm going to talk a little bit now on um, agriculture's impact on climate. So as, as Lori had shared, um, kind of across the board, we have to figure out how we are going to reduce emissions across all sectors, and agriculture is certainly is one of them. And agriculture, it, it currently accounts for about a quarter of all of the emissions um, on the planet. Um, in the past, it was largely loss of forest in the tropics for expanding agriculture. But now what's happening is um, over time, it's become a slight increase from um, impact of how our agricultural lands are managed. and a decrease in the impact of, um, of, of loss of forest um, in the tropics elsewhere. So while on one hand it seems like a good story, if you look at the overall line, it's still uh, increasing and going up. It's not flat or, or going down. So when you look at the sources of agriculture's impact on climate, one of the big ones is, um, is methane that is produced by um, uh, our cattle and sheep and, and some other animals as well. Um, so in our, our, our beef and dairy, there's, um, there's a high amount of, uh, I guess, uh, embodied um, effect uh, on the climate um, that is in, those, uh, in, in, that, uh, in that food. When you look at croplands, um, rice actually accounts for about half of all the emissions. And the reason that is, is that one of the ways of, of growing rice in, in most of the areas where it's grown is that it's flooded. And similar to like a wetland area, is that when you have a saturated soil, um, it's anaerobic, um, you end up having um, a processing of, of the carbon and it's released as, as methane. 
Um, and then, although only a small amount of area uh, is being cleared for agriculture where there um, is peat um, in the soils, or, or the soils are peatlands, um, it has uh, a very large impact. Um, and the rest is um, a small amount or a smaller amount that is from uh, excess amount of fertilizer. I mentioned this about rice. Um, I don't need to cover it again. Um, when in, in peatlands, I said, even though it's a smaller area uh, across the globe, it actually has uh, a, a fairly big uh, impact. Um, and that's because um, the amount of impact per area in that there is um, a tremendous amount of carbon that's stored in the peatlands. Uh, I'm sure for everybody here, I'm stating the obvious, but. Um, and as the case of water availability and water quality, uh, a small set of places um, and a small set of commodities like oil palm are, are driving most of the forest loss and, um, and in this case, uh, in the draining of, 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 of peatlands. Um, from our, our fertilizer, um, a small amount of what is applied uh, ends up as um, N2O. Um, when you look at where that occurs um, over the world, um, it, it certainly is, uh, is similar in that it's a, a small set of places around the world, small set of crops, and um, in a few years ago, we had done an analysis that kind of um, takes what was done in the IPCC to, um, I guess, another step or advancement. And when we had re reanalyzed all the data, what we were seeing is that um, the amount of N2O emissions um, is not uh, just a coefficient that is a function of how much is applied but actually the more that you apply, you start to get a, um, uh, exponential um, rate of increase in emissions. So we've summarized a lot of this um, in a paper. A number of the slides that I've shown uh, are from that as well. Um, and again, it just, it tries to hit home on the story of small set of crops and places are driving most of what um, is, is happening around the world. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more on climate change here. This is just a simple figure of um, just kind of illustrating on how um, a number of cities around the world and the um, expected amount of change and not very far out. but you'll see that um, some areas are getting wetter, some areas are getting drier. Um, in general, they are all um, are getting warmer. Huh, when I um, saved this over to PowerPoint, it got pretty ugly. Um, so what we, um, what we generally see around the world is that um, in the future, there's likely to be uh, less of an impact on, on, on crop production uh, in the north, and in some cases already a, a little bit of increases as a result of climate change. But um, in, in, in the tropics, um, what we are generally seeing now, as well as what's estimated into the future, is more of a negative impact on croplands. So in places like in the U.S., not sure what's going on here. Okay, so in places like in the U.S., <clears throat> what we've seen is that while there has been an impact on climate, is that our our our, our rate of increase in yields as a result of, of better seeds and fertilizer practices, et cetera, has has been able to offset the impacts of climate change. However. Um, that's likely not to always be the case. 
And when we've looked around the world, we've seen that um, our, our climate change has already had an impact on, um, on our, our yields of a number of crops. Uh, I have, have too many maps on there. Apologize, I'll change the slide in the future. Um, but what we see here is that for like um, barley and cassava, that uh, in general, we've already had enough change in our climate from the 1980s that it has had a negative uh, impact on our yields. So when we did this analysis, it is accounting for um, a general increase in yields where they are occurring uh, as a result of, of changes in, um, in management and fertilizer, et cetera. <clears throat> so what we tried to show here was just the impact of climate. And most of the calories that are consumed around the world are uh, rice, which is in the upper one, and wheat, which is in the, in the right-hand side. And what we're seeing is that um, we've already had enough of a change in climate that it is impacting uh, our, our yields for rice and wheat, uh, most of where they uh, are grown around the world. In some cases, that's a little bit. In some cases, it's a lot. But in general, it's a negative story. So in addition to a shift in the, in the mean climate, obviously there's another story, is that we're seeing more and more extreme events. When we look at the, at the changes in, um, in, in variability, and we've looked over time, what we've already started to see is that um, there's uh, about a third of the year-to-year -year variability in yields is tied to um, variability in, um, in temperature and, and moisture. Um, and I think that's a pretty small uh, or a pretty low estimate in that when we did the analysis, we only looked at um, a small set of factors of uh, uh, of temperature and, and and precipitation. Um, on on the pasture lands around the world, we're seeing that the variability of of rainfall, which strongly affects the um, productivity of of the pasture lands, um, has been increasing. Uh, in a large part of the pastures um, around the world. So it's putting um, these areas more at risk. More and more, what people are starting to do is to tie um, what we're eating and its impact on our health and climate. It's not, uh, they are not independent. So if you look at like um, a serving size of um, a handful of foods, um, you can, what we're starting to look at, and when I say we, it's not our team, but um, a large group of people, um, <clears throat> is, um, is looking at not only the amount of, of calories and carbohydrates and protein, but starting to look at um, a deeper level in terms of what are, are the micronutrients that are um, in these foods. Um, so then what we can do from there is we say, well, if we know how much zinc is in, um, in broccoli or uh, in soy, et cetera, from there what we can do is map um, where is zinc produced um, around the world or where is folate is, is produced around the world. You can then take it a cut further and look at, um, well, in terms of uh, zinc, uh, much of it is produced on, actually looks like a uh, fairly even spread across uh, small, medium, and large farms um, for a number of, of, of micronutrients that 
is not the case and is oftentimes is concentrated uh, in small farms uh, around the world. And how the climate ties into this is not only impacts on yields, but some studies have showed that um, increased amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has a negative impact on the amount of zinc, iron, and protein and folate that's, um, that uh, is in, in the crops. So ultimately, while, um, should I just check the time here? Um, so ultimately, while I'm talking about um, all of, of, of the larger scale activities, um, ultimately, where our food is produced is on individual farms, and the farms um, are very different around the world. So the types of strategies that we use to address uh, issues that are local and regional and global are, are very different. Um, and so what I've shared so far is more along the lines of a doom and gloom, like our water is in trouble, our climate is in trouble, habitat, et cetera. So what I want to show here is a few examples of some of the um, excellent work that's being done around the world at a smaller scale and in some cases is, is scaling up. So in some parts of the world, um, wow, sorry, some things have changed. Um, so what we're seeing in some parts of the world is, um, is use of, of technology is making it um, uh, much more um, efficient in terms uh, of fertilizer use and water. And as a result, you can get higher yields, uh, more of buffering uh, in terms in, in times of uh, extreme events. Um, and, and the yields are, are higher and, and the soil health uh, is better. Obviously, that's all ideal if they are all together. <clears throat> also, what we're seeing is that uh, a tremendous number of companies as a result of, uh, of pressure from um, us as, as consumers have made a set of commitments around uh, eliminating deforestation uh, in their um, products. So the good news here is that um, since many of the companies work across a number of countries, um, if they are making a set of commitments that they are then monitoring and, uh, and, um, and are, are successful at, we would be able to see a faster rate of change. Um, so far what we've seen is a number of companies have made a number of commitments. Um, a much smaller subset of them have put a number on, um, on a commitment in terms of um, either amount of land or a certain date. Uh, and yet a smaller number uh, have started to look at are, are they meeting their um, targets or not. So it's a work in progress, but it is um, a, a, a step forward. And as a way to check um, on a company um, or an area around the world, there are these new tools that um, make it much more um, open and transparent about what forest is, is being cleared where, and in some places in the world, what are the set of, of, of companies that are associated with acquiring soy or oil palm or other commodities in those areas. <coughs> um, on, on, on smaller scale activities, through um, uh, adoption of, of new varieties of uh, of seeds and changes in, in management practices um, have, have, have resulted in um, increases uh, in yields. <coughs> and there are a number of um, programs out there that are providing small loans, which helps a farmer get um, access 
to uh, seed and fertilizer information early in the season, in the middle of the season, at the end of the season. Um, and as a result of that, um, a lot of farmers uh, in different places in the world have seen uh, increases in, in not only yields, but ultimately uh, in, in the um, income uh, at, at the family level. <clears throat> Oftentimes what is missing um, throughout Africa, Asia, um, is um, access to information as simple as, is it going to rain today or not? Or is it likely, um, is it going to rain like in the near future or not? And that information can be used to help, um, help inform when you plant, when you fertilize, when you harvest, et cetera. So there are some startup um, companies that are, are developing new systems that um, are providing a forecast to um, a, a lot of farmers um, with this information. Um, we're also seeing examples of um, a change in how a crop is planted, um, which has resulted in more efficiency in terms of, of water, um, and the yields have been higher. And this is a pretty amazing case of, of, of the rapid adoption rate um, that has happened here in India. So a lot of what I had shared here certainly is in a number of, of publications from our team and many others. Um, and if people are interested in more, we have, have summarized a lot of this information and have a number of maps and graphics um, if, if you want to use them in your own, uh, own, own presentations. So we have like a, a short a summary on, um, on um, demand for food now and in the future, uh, impact of diet, uh, waste, Water, I think we have one on fertilizer too and water quality. Um, agriculture's impact on climate, um, health and nutrition, um, the climate risk on our pastures, and uh, a few others. So oftentimes um, I'm asked, which I'm sure that a number of you are as well, is when you are working on food and climate and these other issues that are um, overwhelming uh, at times. Um, where I find uh, hope is that there are excellent e examples of what um, is possible around the world. And then also know that there are a lot of people around the world like you or us that um, are, are working toward a better future. So. I thank you for that. And that's it. Yeah. Grab some water. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Shapiro Bingson. I'm from the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One clarification question. You mentioned the you had a graph with the um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, uh, agricultural management and from uh, uh, deforestation. Mm -hmm. Is so the um, is some I'm thinking some of the deforestation is due to uh, clearing uh, forest for uh, uh, for feed production and so forth. Um, I was thinking how that is, if that is uh, accounted for in the agricultural um, um, 
management part. And the other question is uh, if you also looked into um, uh, crop shifting in for on lands in, in order to increase yields. Um, as far as, uh, as the first question, um, what, um, yes, um, so what that, what the analysis has shown is the amount of forest around the world that, that is, is lost every year, and then the emissions uh, would or does include um, emissions from uh, activities on that land after it is cleared. Does that make sense, or does that answer your question? Um, and the second one on um, on the shifting of crops, I didn't uh, um, I didn't understand that one. So if you would ask that again, or maybe don't. Have the, I'm sorry. So crop rotation on the same uh, land, if right. that has a. Um, uh, could have a benefit in the in yields from from that land. Uh, yes, um, and a great question. Um, um, what I haven't shown up here, but is um, um, embedded in the analysis, is that um, many places in the world, certainly across the tropics, but especially in Asia and parts of South America, is that you have. Um, a couple of crops on the same area of land in a given year, um, and in some cases that is uh, is rice that is harvested a couple times a year or three times a year. Uh, in other places, like in um, in South America, it's common that you have like um, have soy and then either have maize or um, or cotton or sunflower, um, and there. Uh, up, up until like the 80s or so, at least in the U.S., and I'm, I'm not sure how it is here in Europe, but um, there used to be a lot of, of small grains that were planted um, as part of a rotation of um, like a, a feed crop, uh, and like like it, it might go from like. Um, uh, oats to maize, alfalfa for a few years, and it was always um, a, a shifting. Um, but certainly now that we've had such a kind of a high, like a set price and subsidies on um, maize and soy, it it has driven a change in the landscape, uh, at least in the U.S. And certainly we're seeing that in in Brazil and Argentina as well, um, where it's more. A, a commodity crop that is, is grown every every year. Does that answer what you were? Okay, thank you. Um, Li Shen from uh, Utrecht University. I have a question uh, about, I saw the slides when a lot large corporate move away from zero deforestation palm oil exciting to see and I, I believe that that will move things faster than government efforts. Um, many of those statements have been made kind of a couple of years ago. Have we, um, no, do we already know, is there, do we, is there evidence what is on the ground, what is, what is happening, do we already see that the deforestation in Indonesia and, and in, in Malaysia has been kind of stopped um, mm -hmm. by these by this forces? Um, yes, so um, an e e excellent question, um, because it's one thing to make a commitment, and it's another thing to actually see it happen. Um, so um, I forget how many, there's a set of com companies and countries um, and organizations that made a set of commitments to cut all deforestation in half by 2020, and eliminate it in, in 2030. Um, and obviously we are coming up on that. And we certainly have not seen that. Um, it's kind of hard to attribute to um, a specific, like, a company um, in that when, uh, say, 
oil palm is sourced. It might be from a mill that is aggregating from a whole number of farmers, um, and similar for soy in Brazil and, and cattle in Brazil. Um, now, we certainly have been seeing like, um, like a win in certain parts of the Amazon, um, certain parts of um, um, Indonesia or Malaysia. Um, one of the projects our team is working on now is in preparation for um, all of the conversations that we assume are going to happen um, a year from now is um, what we've been seeing is that while uh, some places we will have a win, at the same time we're seeing more of a shifting to where the clearing is happening. Um, so what our aim to do um, is to kind of is show that um, that what's happening is more you're seeing a shifting of where most of the of the clearing is happening in space, but the overall amount isn't changing that much. Um, and then we kind of did a little thought exercise, and if you think through it, um, there can actually be a situation where um, every single company makes a commitment, say on soy, in the Amazon, in Sahado, and Chaco, other parts of, of South America. And if that, um, if, if the commitment is measured at the scale of a farm, um, that um, all of the companies could be in compliance at the farm level, but you would still see soy driving what is, uh, is changing the landscape because more and more what we're seeing is that soy is replacing, say, a pasture or other crops, and the amount of those other crops is not, um, uh, that those are still increasing, and so what's happening is that those are moving to um, other places. So then what we would like to do is to kind of put together some ideas about, um, well, what, um, what type of system could we have that would shift it more from uh, what we have now is even with our good intentions is that we are not able to uh, achieve them, but is more like how could you create a situation where, say, a set of, of uh, of, of countries and companies and organizations are working together so that, say, within a country that there is a set of policies that are, are reinforcing what a country and company are, um, are committing to so that um, at the landscape scale or a scale of a political unit that you are seeing the outcomes. Um, Long way of a of answering. Does that help? Okay. Thanks. Well, for just just um, a short comment on the last one. We, here in Europe, we have the Amsterdam Declaration, um, which is being implemented, and there's is measurement on its effectiveness and so forth. And we're we're actually working on on doing a tracking. And what you just mentioned in the last sentence, the landscape or the territorial approach, is a way forward away from the supply side right. kind of trap, um, because there are indirect effects you may actually induce, um, w which, as you said, won't resolve the problem unless you have the full coverage of the land. Um, my question would be on, let's say, I was a little bit frustrated. My, my expectation was that you would at least address agroforestry. Mm. Um, and not as a wonder option, but as an important option which is a different view on how you do agriculture. Um, and is there a reason for it why you didn't mention it? Um, no. I mean, it's not like um, I don't think it's a good practice, but there are a number of practices. But um, yes, certainly, um, you know, it has been um, a traditional practice uh, throughout a lot of uh, Africa and parts of Asia, and certainly in South America as well. Um, there has been more of a shift away from that over time, but now m more and more people are 
adopting that again. And what they've been able to see is that you have a higher amount of carbon, of, of biodiversity. There are some arguments, maybe a little bit of data, that show that the um, types of fats and nutrients that are in the milk and, and beef are, are better for us. Um, the amount of income can be higher, the, the number of jobs can be higher. Um, I think one of the big obstacles in part is education um, in that even though it was a traditional way of farming, a lot of information maybe is lost. Um, and then also, um, you know, it, it takes a certain amount of investment and not just in terms of capital, but in terms of time, which of course affects, you know, the uh, income. Um, because at least the examples that I've seen in, in Colombia and, and Peru and Brazil um, and Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, um, you know, oftentimes you're not really seeing those high returns for like uh, a couple of decades, um, um, at least in terms of the, of, the, of the outcomes that you would maybe expect at, at the high, um, high levels. Um, but, um, so anyway, I, I think that that is um, a barrier. Another thing that I, um, I wonder about that as a strategy is, um, I've, I've never seen it on a large scale, um, which, which doesn't mean it's not possible, um, but the examples I've seen, you know, you have um, a rancher, who's, it's usually a rancher who is usually a man, and uh, his, say his kids or his dad, um, who have um, a herd, say, of 50 cattle and move them every day. Um, so it's a very um, labor uh, intensive um, and it would, I think, would be hard to do that on a large scale. Um, possibly I'm wrong, but um, uh, most of our, our rangelands now are very extensive. So that is, um, I guess, another challenge that I, I see, but it could be that I don't know enough about it, um, which is completely possible. Um, <clears throat> that uh, as far as scaling up, is there a way to do it beyond small farm by small farm? Yes. I have a question. So you, you focus, uh, uh, sorry, I'm Julian Carré, I'm a researcher here in uh, Toulouse. Um, you, you focus uh, on your talk a lot on, on the yield, and uh, well, increasing the yield might require, in the in the pathway that you uh, that you present, uh, increasing uh, the energy, the fertilizer, the use of more complex seeds, uh, giving a smartphone to every farmer on this planet, and putting some sensor on the on the farm. And so, I would like to know if there is not uh, a trade-off between uh, the. Uh, the increasing of the yield and the global sustainability of the agriculture system, because we know that in the very intensive uh, agriculture system, you have some soil erosion and uh, it's uh, less sustainable. And we have some example on uh, our modern uh, system. So, isn't uh, is there a trade-off? And by focusing on the yield, uh, do you miss maybe a global view uh, on the uh, on the technical system uh, for food production? Um. It's a great question. Um, as far as what I was saying in terms of increasing yields in certain places around the world, those are, in general, are places where there is very little or no application of fertilizer. Um, and so even small amounts, um, and since it's so expensive, um, say in parts of Africa and Asia, um, it generally is not applied the way it is um, say, in, in good parts of South America, North America, Europe, where um, it, 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 it is spread more broadly. Um, a number of times, it's, it's literally uh, fertilizer in a soda cap that when there is um, a planting, there's also a little bit of fertilizer that's added. So it's, it's a very small amount. Um, and say if you're looking at impacts on climate, 
um, and to O, while um, it is um, a byproduct, I guess you'd call it, of, of a application of fertilizer, um, the way the relationship is between the amount that's applied and the emissions, um, in many places where, the, where there's almost no application is that um, there, there is such a small impact on, um, on climate. So in many places, that's not as much of an issue as, say, um, say a, a small change uh, in China could have a huge impact, and that same amount of fertilizer change. Um, so in, in China would have like zero impact on the yields, but would have a big impact on climate. That same amount of application, say in Malawi, um, would have a very big impact on yields and a very small impact on climate. So that's maybe where a trade-off um, occurs. But you are right in that um, that there is always a trade-off of intensification and uh, impact on the environment. And I think it is um, a false assumption that if you don't have intensive agriculture, you don't have an impact on the environment. Because um, in many cases, you, 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 you might have, have just as much. It's just it's spread over a larger area. Hello, Gregory Gredon. Uh, I work in Toulouse, and I'm part of the association Toulouse in Transition. We are part of the Transition Network. Um, the question that was asked before is uh, pretty much what I think also. Uh, I'm very scared of what you have shown and the way your studies are going, because it ref seems to reflect what is going on around the world. I uh, do have a conversion myself in agriculture, and uh, we have s we can in your presentation what we are showing is that uh, one of the issues is a global uh, transport also, but you are still show not showing that uh, reducing the global transport of food and nutrients all over the world would be one of the solutions. So to go back to local agriculture to go back to smaller agriculture. One of the issues is to free seeds, to have a number of various seeds. Um, the way you are showing it's still also oriented to high technology, where you are not uh, mentioning low technologies that would be more sustainable. But everything that you are showing has a trade-off, as it was said just before. And you are not showing the orientation that will be more sustainable. That's in seems has to be the direction still going on. It's really the business as usual. And it is quite scary for me. It's not on your fault, but it is. I don't understand why you are not mentioning permaculture, why you are not mentioning that smaller, uh, more uh, manual. Yeah, yeah, sure, but that's my question. That's why we don't see in the solutions to free seeds less fertilizer. Fertilizer is not the solution, regenerative agriculture. So because for a soil to be able to uh, produce its uh, own fertilizer, so why are you not looking at this, showing these kind of so, uh, solutions that really will be the sustainable way? Well, everything you are showing, from my point of view, the only my point of view, is they, they take us to a, a, a crisis that is going to crush everyone. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, excellent point. Uh, in many ways, I, I share your fears. Um, the reason that I, I generally don't highlight that um, is that um, it's really it's not the case with rice. Um, but with the case with wheat, um, maize, at least where it is used for feed, and soy, uh, and sugarcane, generally um, are happening on, on, 
on larger farms. And in many places in the world, there are, are fewer and fewer farmers over time. Um, so I think maybe what is more of a solution is on how to bring some of, of the best practices that are being adopted and maybe have always been used on small farms to help improve um, health of the soil and maybe more efficiency in terms of nutrients, um, which uh, may I influence the amount of uh, the fertilizer that has to be produced. Um, I think there are more options of maintaining or shifting to smaller farms for uh, fruits and vegetables, but um, our major grains make up like, um, uh, if, if, you, if you look at just even wheat, rice, and maize, that is, um, is, is two-thirds of all the calories that are produced on croplands. So uh, as much as it is a trade-off, um, we need that kind of mass um, unless we stop eating our, our major grains, which is pretty unlikely. Um, but I, I hear your point, and thank you. Okay. Hello, my name is Ludivine Pradelex from AgroParisTech Montpellier. I have a very short question. It's in the same vein of what has been uh, asked just before. It is why you didn't mention uh, anything about the crop livestock integration, uh, which offers big opportunities to close loops and to work in a more efficient way to, to save resources and working at a local uh, scale. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, excellent point, and I think maybe in many ways it's similar to um, a question earlier on um, on civil pastoral systems or um, agroforestry. Um, I think that as a practice um, maybe was more common in the past and now is, is being seen again as um, a positive way forward. Um, it currently is at um, a smaller scale, so I think um, while those are e excellent practices, I think the challenge is going to be to figure out how we are able to scale them up, either in terms of larger farms or more and more small farms that are uh, adopting those um, types of practices. Um, on medium and large farms, well, I guess what, what would be called extremely large here, um, maybe small to maybe medium in Brazil, um, it's not extremely common, but um, what has been adopted in some areas is a rotation where there is uh, is grass and pasture that is planted for a few years and grazed, and that's a way of, of building up the health and soil and not um, building up, say, a set of, um, of pests and diseases that uh, are associated with soy, and then um, and plowing that up, say, after um, after after five years or seven or ten, uh, and planting soy again, that in the medium and longer term, that that provides more of a, a stable um, income and um, a higher amount of money over time and less inputs into the soil. So um, it, I, I think there are examples of it happening at a larger scale. Um, I don't know of a whole lot, though. Yeah, it's very short. Uh, thank you. Yannick Malbert, uh, working for a small company, Natural Mode. Uh, I fully agree with uh, this type of comments. And I just would like to know, uh, you know, crops, it's forest, ton, it's crops. So you didn't speak about implementing agriculture in ton. Sorry, Urban? 
Uh, agriculture uh, in okay. town. Yeah, yeah, uh, urban agriculture. Yeah, I, I know that it's, um, it's becoming um, more widespread. Um, and I think it can be helpful at a local scale, um, maybe as much for um, uh, education as far as where our food is coming from, how it's produced, that uh, it's not, uh, uh, it, it doesn't just show up in a can at the grocery store um, or at the market. But um, I don't think it's a solution at a large scale. And the reason I say that is because, um, you know, urban areas occupy like three or four percent of all the land on the planet, and agriculture is 40 percent. So um, if you just look at the basic numbers, even if our urban areas were uh, all, you know, used as, 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 as gardens everywhere that's possible, and had plants that are grown inside, on the sides of buildings and tops of buildings, um, we still wouldn't be able to provide enough at a large scale, but at a local scale, it certainly offers a lot of opportunities. 